This is the Emergency Medical Minute. I was going to present a case of a patient who came in with massive bilateral lower extremity edema. So I was going to use that as a springboard to uh, uh, discuss sort of the differential diagnosis uh, of pedal edema, what type of workup we undertake, uh, and then uh, with regard to this specific diagnosis, uh, some of the treatment and the disposition uh, for this patient. So in terms of backstory, patient was, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to protect uh, his anonymity. Uh, he was a 65-year-old male uh, who had really no significant contributory history, uh, some hypertension on blood pressure meds, uh, but no history of things like heart failure or kidney failure or liver failure, no history of DVTs or PEs, uh, who came in with subacute leg swelling, actually referred in by the pr uh, primary care doctor, because the swelling was so massive that they thought the patient needed an emergent evaluation and consideration for admission, okay? So uh, in terms of the exam, uh, the patient, uh, what are some of the things that you'd look for? I'll describe the pedal edema, which was four plus pitting edema, uh, massive, uh, you know, to the mid thighs. Uh, and then what are other components of either the history or the exam that you'd want to know? Skin color, any so, so no trauma, good pulses, the skin color, you know, a little bit of what I would describe as some chronic venous stasis changes, so a little bit of bluish discoloration, no real significant skin breakdown, no palpable cord. What else? The breathing? Great. So the breathing, uh, bigger guy, a little seemed a little bit labored, but that was apparently baseline for him. Uh, but when you listen to the lungs, importantly, the lungs were clear and he had no JVD. Liver function. Uh, no, I don't. Liver function. So laboratory-wise, uh, some of the things that uh, go into the differential, uh, Steve points correctly to the fact that something like massive ascites, we've seen that obviously with pedal edema, the patient had normal liver function tests, not a drinker, no history of liver problems. Kidneys, normal kidney. Uh, that uh, Emily touches on a good point there. Uh, renal failure can generally give you anasarca, uh, but it would be most significant in dependent areas. Nephrosis, where you're losing too much protein in the urine, can also give you anasarca. Uh, so you know that would be sort of something that normally has uh, normal kidney function, but you check the urine and make sure that there's no evidence of sort of. Uh, uh, significant albuminuria to suggest uh, uh, nephrosis. So kidney function was normal, urine was clean. Uh, BNP? What's that? BNP? BNP, normal. So you ask that for left heart failure or sometimes right heart, heart failure, uh, that would be sort of a, a, a big category that we'll talk about as far as pedal edema. Heart, yeah, normal, normal cardiopulmonary exam, uh, actually. Uh, and then his EKG uh, had no evidence of LVH, actually no evidence of RVH, uh, no evidence of ischemia. So massive edema, right? So uh, in terms of differential diagnosis, uh, we, look, we think about systemic causes and we think about local causes, okay? So systemic causes are the things that we've touched, uh, uh, talked about. So uh, left heart failure is the main cause of right heart failure. Uh, and diffuse edema, but we said that he had normal lungs uh, uh, and, you know, normal heart size, uh, normal EKG, uh, liver. Uh, so for uh, ascites or cirrhosis, uh, he had normal liver function tests. And, you know, if we did an abdominal ultrasound, it would have been negative. Uh, kidney function is normal. So those are sort of the main systemic causes. And the main uh, 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 localized causes would be sort of massive venous stasis, or sometimes you can get like an IVC clot. So we did a NEVA, and both of those were negative. So what does this guy have? And it's actually something relatively common. Uh, uh, so Ian, you wanted to make a point? I was going to see if there was something compressing his IVC. Um, right. It's a good. It's a good thought. But we did a NEVA, uh, and there was not. There wasn't that. So 
lymphedema? Yeah, that, that is uh, a rare but uh, uh, important cause of localized uh, uh, swelling, but that's not his cause either. Allergic reaction? Nope. Same thing. So, no. So I'll, I'll just sort of cut to the chase. So this guy... <laughs> <laughs> I got a couple more. Yeah. So uh, this guy had a habitus, which is called Pickwickian. Uh, have, has anyone ever heard that term? So it was based... For what? Yeah. So it was based on a Charles Dickens novel. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah, Pickwick. <laughs> right. Pickwick was a character in it. Uh, do you remember his descriptor? Like he, a lot of trunkal obesity. He was considered always tired. He snored a lot when he slept. So basically, what this guy had is what uh, ends up being uh, described as obesity hypoventilation syndrome. So uh, people, uh, the clinical criteria for it uh, is that you have obesity, which is you know, BMI, defined as a BMI greater than 30, his BMI was like 45, uh, so that's sort of morbid obesity. Uh, then when we checked the blood gas, uh, his PCO2 was 48, okay, and his bicarb, I think, was like 32. Um, and uh, when you asked his wife, he uh, has a history of a lot of snoring. So those are actually the three criteria for obesity hypoventilation syndrome, those three. And the pathophysiology of it basically is, you know, it seems somewhat intuitive that if someone has a lot of obesity mechanically, they can't ventilate uh, and they start retaining. But there's also hormonal mechanisms. Uh, One of the sort of substrates for obesity is that you have a leptin resistance in your hypothalamus. So leptin is produced by adipose tissues. And it sort of helps control satiety. You might have heard it in that context. But it ends up that if people have that uh, leptin resistance in the hypothalamus, they actually have decreased ventilatory drive, right? And so those patients tend to get, uh, uh, and they also have obstructive sleep apnea uh, because of their habitus. So all of those things come together uh, to cause people to be uh, periodically hypoxic uh, during the night. Uh, and that leads, in general, to right heart strain and uh, right uh, ventricular dysfunction, uh, and it causes uh, right hearted, right-sided heart failure. Interestingly, you know, uh, chest X-ray or an EKG is not sensitive for it. You know, it's a cardiac echo, uh, sleep study. Uh, in a, uh, those are sort of the outpatient tests that I talked to his primary care doctor about. And the patient clearly had those sort of criteria of the elevated BMI, sleep disorder breathing, and the VBG that showed the PCO2 and the bicarb that was elevated. And, you know, it's a very morbid diagnosis if it's untreated, uh, you know, uh, and uh, with appropriate treatment uh, like CPAP and BiPAP, uh, weight loss, uh, uh, people generally do uh, much better. Okay? Questions? Why was his, his legs swollen? Why? Uh, right, massive right heart failure. Right heart failure. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right. Why wasn't what? Why wasn't what? No, no, no. What? That's what I said in the first place when you initially started talking about it. I was like, oh, right sided heart failure. Oh. Then you started saying that his BMP was normal. Yeah, so, so it's not I'm sensitive for. Why. So, the, so the most common cause of right heart failure yeah. is left heart failure. Right. So usually we see an elevated BMP, yeah. but a BMP is not sensitive for right heart failure. Oh, okay, that's right. You said the echo, right? Yeah, yeah. So, that, okay. so, so they get an echo to diagnose it with, they get pulmonary hypertension. Mm. So is that more of like a rule out diagnosis? Like once you've basically done everything and... So, so if like the stuff that we did here, yeah. all normal, and yeah. then if he meets that criteria, mm-hmm. then it's, uh, there's specific criteria. It's mm-hmm. not something that we normally test for here, but I mean, it was, it was definitely his cause. You know? Okay. No, interesting. No. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Emergency Medical Minute is, and always will be, about free medical education. Medicine's most prolific podcast is successful because of our supporters, donors, and of course, our listeners. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you support spreading free medical education, please donate at our website, emergencymedicalminute.com. As always, keep listening.